Okay, I want to do a kind of summation of, of where we've been and um, I want to go back to the beginning where I suggested that in a certain sense the wisdoms of the East kind of pollute the spirituality of the West. And this pollution is in the maintaining of traditional ideas that are carried by the East about the nature of the I and the purposes of meditation and spiritual development. Now one of the things that one can find out, for example, is a certain thing that happened actually with Eastern wisdoms. When the Buddha was finished being an incarnate individual, he had left behind a system which was designed to teach the individual who practiced it how to leave the wheel of life, how to not continue to have to incarnate and go to what was called the state of nirvana. Now you can read this in the research of, of Rudolf Steiner, but the Buddha was the Gautama Buddha, who was the sixth Buddha. There's a seventh Buddha hanging around, going to show up, and I think a total of twelve. But anyway, so Gautama Buddha had a purely spiritual existence, and he participated <coughs> in the incarnation of the Creator that left the earliest indications of its happening in Christianity, in institutional Christianity, which, again, doesn't get it. Okay, They don't get it. There's a lot of mistakes, but understandable. Anyway, at the time that the Incarnation happened, Buddha himself came to different conclusions about what he had taught. And the difference was very subtle. But then in the development of Buddhism itself as a discipline, the saints of Buddhism who came to understand the difference because they would have a vertical relationship with the Buddha by following him and practicing his practices that he taught. Following the incarnation of Christ and following this transformation of the Buddha, you have the appearance of what's called the Bodhisattva vow. And the Bodhisattva vow in Buddhism basically says, yes, I have the capacity to leave the wheel of life and go to the condition of nirvana. I can go back at least to the idea of original participation or to reintegration, however you want to say it. We've talked about this a little bit before. Or final participation, which is the way it's talked about in the cultural West. I can go back to this. But, I'm going to sacrifice that possibility and remain on the wheel of life, continue to incarnate until, until all sentient beings can achieve the state of enlightenment. Now that's the Bodhisattva vow. And that arises because of the influence and the sacrifice of the Creator to enter into life and to die as a human being that had an effect on the teaching of Buddhism such that Buddhism began to contain within itself the Bodhisattva vow, in which, no, I don't go to Nirvana, I stay on the earth, I continue to incarnate until everybody can achieve enlightenment, all sentient beings. Now in the West, the effect of all this was to recognize that the way of science, which was eventually to emerge out of Western culture, is a valid way, but it needed to be united, which is what Rudolf Steiner did sort of explicitly. There were a lot of other people, as I mentioned, Emerson and so on, who knew how to do this instinctively. This inner spiritual life, the life that we have of the mind, the life of thinking, can undergo a metamorphosis through our own co-creative activity. That is, we are now creators of that. So that the teaching of living, thinking, and action is the Western way of causing the metamorphosis of thinking so that thinking can do something that it wasn't able to do in the past and which is not recognized in the cultural East as being able to do, which is to transform all areas of human knowledge. 
And as we go on into these videos where I begin to bring before those people who are on this, taking an interest in on becoming a real wizard, you're going to find me bringing forth the products made by those people who have begun this transformation of thinking as they revitalize and change all human knowledge. I hope you got it.